Let me give everyone a quick update as well. We have votes that have been called, of course, uh, about 10.15 today. And so we're going to get started, go through this panel, opening statements and such, and see how far that we uh, can get before they call the votes, votes. And then we'll make that judgment call as we go. Just give everyone a quick scheduling update on that. With that, the committee will come to order. Oversight, um, Oversight and Government Relations uh, Committee, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money that Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers do have the right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people, bring genuine reform to federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. I would like to thank all the witnesses in both panels today for participating in today's hearing. I hope this is an informative hearing where witnesses can share best practices and form relationships going forward that will encourage our mutual due diligence. Federal government spends more than $500 billion on contracts each year. Most contractors are patriots who fulfill their contractual obligations to the Federal Government in spite of the mountains of Federal forms and frustrations. They provide indispensable products. They deliver quality services to Federal agencies. But unfortunately, this Committee has examined instances in the past which certain contractors tried to defraud the Government where they demonstrate a pattern of inability to deliver on their contractual commitments. One of the tools that agencies have to address this unethical, fraudulent, or chronically poor-performing contractors is the remedy of suspension and debarment. Today we will hear testimony that while some agencies are effective in using this administrative remedy to weed out bad actors who waste taxpayer dollars, other agencies are simply not fulfilling their responsibility to suspend or debar. This hearing will explore the following question. Why is it that some agencies are able to uncover problems with their contractors and take dozens of suspension and debarment actions each year, while other agencies with similar or larger contract spending initiate virtually no action? Well, I hope it is because some agencies have high-quality high, high contractors and they have not experienced any contracting issues. It is unlikely that there are no poor-performing or dishonest contractors working for the agencies that have not suspended or debarred any contractors. Common sense would seem to suggest these agencies are not looking for and thus not uncovering fraud on the part of their contractors. In some cases, though, these agencies may simply accept poor performance or staff may not complete the follow-up paperwork or help others avoid the same, contra same bad contractors in the future. GAO's work bears out our suspicion that agencies that focus on using the tool of suspension debarment and make it a priority are successful at rooting out future waste and fraud by excluding the contractor from future business with the government or forcing the contractor to take needed corrective measures. Clearly, it takes a concerted effort to identify candidates for suspension and debarment, develop the necessary factual record, and at the same time provide the required due process safeguards for contractors. The alternative, however, is not an option. Agencies that put in the necessary work to implement a robust suspension and debarment program can expect to see returns on their investment in terms of programmatic fraud or waste avoided. In addition, because of the government-wide exclusion that can result from suspension and debarment actions, having an effective suspension and debarment program also serves to strengthen the integrity of the overall contracting system. It sends a clear message that dishonest contractors or shoddy work will not be accepted, which protects taxpayer dollars from flowing to subpar contractors. This committee is a watchdog for the taxpayers' money, but we also think it is reasonable to expect each agency to be diligent, ferreting out bad actors they know in the contracting world so we can stop contracting fraud. The American people, they deserve our attention. I would also like to thank Chairman Towns, who held hearings on this same subject in 2009 and in 2010. He has put sunlight on this process, and we will continue to do that until it is fixed. I look forward to hearing the testimony today about how we can keep unethical contractors out of the Federal system. I now would like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Connolly, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this important hearing. The GAO report in the context of the final report of the Commission on Wartime Contracting, which we heard the other day, should be a deafening alarm bell about waste, wasteful spending that can be curbed through the use of functional suspension and disbarment programs. The National Security Subcommittee held a hearing last month examining potentially corrupt Department of Defense uh, contracting in Afghanistan. Earlier this week, the Commission on Wartime Contracting told our committee that an estimated 31 to $60 billion has been lost to fraud or waste through contracting in Iraq and Afghanistan alone. What is most extraordinary about this figure is not how large it is, but that the Commission told us that it isn't even comprehensive. 
The Federal Government lacks not only the tools to manage overseas DOD contracts, but even the mechanisms to account fully for the money we lose. If there is one lesson we could learn from this experience, it should be that rushing into foreign wars unprepared can be incomprehensibly expensive. The GAO report we are considering today is just as troubling as the Commission on Wartime Contracting Report. GAO reassures us that the Department of Defense, OIG, recently reported that the services and DLA had an effective suspension and debarment process, apparently based on the fact that DOD issues more suspensions and debarments than any other Federal agency. No wonder. Between 2006 and 2010, DOD spent $1,776 billion on contracting, that is to say $1.7 trillion for those of us who would otherwise lose count of the zeros. It is approximately 15,000 percent more money than any other agency spent on contracts, so it should follow that DOD would also issue more suspensions and debarments. While it is very disturbing that some agencies have issued zero suspensions and debarments, uh, unless we are to assume that their contracts are pristine, given the volume of DOD contracts and relative paucity of suspensions and debarments relative to the amounts, we must be vigilant in reducing waste in that department. Rather than looking only at the total number of suspensions and debarments per agencies, maybe we should consider the number of suspension and debarments per contracting dollar. For each $1 billion DOD has spent on contracts, it issued an average of 0 0.9 suspensions and debarments. By contrast, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is, has a witness in today's hearing, has issued 42.6 suspensions or debarments per billion dollar of contracting dollar spent. By this measure, EPA would seem to be far more attentive to protecting taxpayer dollars, frankly, than DOD. Of course, the number of suspensions and debarments per contracting dollar is only informative if we know that there is some fraud or waste that the suspensions or debarments should address. The purpose of suspension and debarment is to protect the taxpayers, not to enact punitive measures against contractors, most of whom are patriotic Americans trying to serve the public, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman. In the case of DOD, we know from the recent Commission report, sadly, that such fraud and waste is so rampant in Iraq and Afghanistan as to be virtually unquantifiable. The United States has spent in excess of $200 billion in contingency contracting to support the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan over the last decade. According to the final report of the Commission on Wartime Contracting, up to $60 billion of those taxpayer dollars were lost to waste, fraud, and abuse. It is imperative that we improve suspension and debarment procedures for DOD so that we don't repeat the waste of money identified by the Commission on Wartime Contracting. I greatly appreciate the willingness of representatives from GAO, DOD, HHS, DHS, and EPA to appear before us today to discuss this important topic. It is clear there is wide variation in the methodology used to determine suspension and debarment, and replicating best practices to reduce waste must be our urgent task so that those agencies have more uniformity and predictability in this process. And I thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. Members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our first panel. Uh, Mr. William T. Woods is the Director of the Government Accountability o Office and the Acquisition and Sourcing Management Team. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Mr. Woods, would you please rise and raise your right hand? Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the te testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll help you God? Thank you. Let the record reflect the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, and obviously we have already discussed as well the votes that are being called at some point, I would like you to limit your testimony. You are the only member of this particular panel, and so five to ten minutes will give you a little bit of flexibility in the time there, but we would like to be able to pummel you with random questions as well <laughs> uh, once we get through your testimony. So honored to be able to receive your testimony. Obviously, your written statement will be made a part of the record as well. You are recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Connolly. Uh, thank you so much for inviting the Government Accountability Office to be here this morning to address what you both have recognized as an extremely important topic in the area of government contracting. Uh, we need uh, a uh, robust suspension and debarment process uh, in order to ensure that the Federal Government uh, does business only with responsible contractors and that we avoid doing business with dishonest contractors 
those that commit uh, illegal acts and those that are uh, irresponsible uh, and unethical. Uh, I am very pleased to uh, be able to release uh, our report this morning, which we did for this committee as well as the Senate uh, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs uh, Committee, addressing the suspension and debarment issue on a government-wide basis. That report is uh, GAO-11-739, and with the uh, permission of the committee, I would like to have that inserted in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my statement today will cover uh, the uh, work that we did to prepare that report, the specific objectives that uh, this committee asked us to address, uh, our findings um, as a result of that work, and our recommendations. Uh, but first, I would like to provide just a very, very brief overview uh, of the process. Uh, first of all, in terms of definitions, uh, a suspension, both suspensions and debarments are exclusions from the Federal contracting process. Suspensions are a temporary uh, remedy, generally lasting about uh, 12 months. Uh, there is a provision for extending that up to 18 months if the uh, Attorney General so requests. Uh, debarments, on the other hand, are for a fixed period of time, uh, generally three years, although uh, those um, uh, can be extended as well. Uh, the suspension and debarments are covered in uh, some detail in the Federal Acquisition Regulation. There is also a parallel process for grants, assistance, loans, loan guarantees, uh, and that sort of thing which are covered under the Non-Procurement Common Rule, or NCR. But both um, procedures are uh, somewhat similar, and they are reciprocal. Uh, in other words, if uh, an entity is debarred under the Federal Acquisition Procedures Rules, that entity is considered to be debarred as well under the Non-Procurement Common Rule, and vice versa. Our first objective was to uh, determine what entities are listed on the excluded parties list system. The excluded parties list is the, uh, a list maintained by the General Services Administration, an electronic online system that uh, contains all of the entities that have been subject to suspension, proposed for debarment, or debarred. That, as I said, is maintained by the GSA. The individual agencies that take the actions are responsible for entering data, names, uh, et cetera, into that EPLS system. And our first objective was really to understand what is in that system. Uh, frankly, I was uh, somewhat surprised at, uh, at the numbers because, as indicated on, um, in my testimony, uh, figure one on page four, uh, the the vast majority of entities that are listed are listed as a result of statutory exclusions. For example, the Department of Health and Human Services might uh, debar or exclude a contractor uh, or an entity for health care fraud. Uh, export control violations are another um, uh, matter where statutes specifically provide that if a violation is found through a judicial process or in some cases an administrative process, the Congress has decided that those entities shall be listed on that excluded parties list system. Now, they may have had nothing to do with Federal contracts, but the consequence of listing on that system is that they are precluded from obtaining a Federal contract. Uh, when we looked at that, we found that about 84 percent were uh, of the cases in the uh, excluded parties list system were as a result of uh, these statutory debarments. The remaining 16 percent were either actions taken under the Federal Acquisition Regulation or actions taken under the Non-Procurement Common Rule. Our second objective was to look behind those numbers and to determine which agencies are active and which agencies are relatively inactive in the area of suspension and debarments. At the request of this committee, we focused just on the procurement-related actions, so on that 16 percent or so that are listed on the uh, excluded parties list system as a result of either non-procurement common rule actions or actions under the Federal Acquisition Regulation. 
I refer you to uh, Appendix 1 on page 10 of the statement that lists uh, all of the major agencies, those that, do, um, uh, that have done uh, about $2 billion or more in contracting over the, over the period that we looked at. We looked back five years, from 2006 through 2010, and as you have already correctly pointed out, the Department of Defense is far and away uh, the largest user of the suspension and debarment system. We wanted to get a snapshot and an idea of um, what are the variables at play and what are the reasons why some agencies appear to be quite active in this area and other agencies less active. So we chose a judgmental sample. We wanted to get a mix of defense and civilian agencies. Uh, within defense, we chose uh, the Navy and the Defense Logistics Agency. We wanted to uh, get, uh, look at some large agencies. We looked at uh, Health and Human Services. We looked at the Department of Homeland Security. Within the Department of Homeland Security, we looked at two entities, one that appeared to be relatively active in the area, that was the Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, Bureau, and one that appeared to be relatively inactive, that was the Federal uh, Emergency Management Agency. Um, we wanted to get a, a, a feel for what are the factors that really account for the variation in these numbers. And we found that three factors account for that variation. First, the, the uh, agencies with the active programs have a, a dedicated program with dedicated staff. It happened that the staff on all of the four agencies that we looked at with active programs had dedicated full-time staff. The second factor was that each of the four agencies with the active programs, and um, uh, for reference, I'm, uh, you may want to refer to Figure 2 on page 5 of my statement, which um, has a, uh, a graphic display of what I'm uh, outlining at this point. But the second factor that, uh, that we found is that the uh, active agencies had detailed policies and procedures not just mirroring what is in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, but providing additional detail to their um, acquisition and non-acquisition personnel on how to uh, deal with uh, uh, contractors that are poor performers, that have been convicted of um, uh, certain transgressions, uh, or are simply unethical. Um, but detailed policies and procedures were an important component of an active process. And the third uh, component was an active referral process. And what that means is that um, uh, agencies went out of their way to train people on how to take advantage of the suspension and debarment process. They had um, active inspectors general who routinely made referrals to the suspension and debarment official. They had contracting officers who would also make a practice of making referrals to the dispension, suspension and debarment uh, official. So those are the three factors that we found at the four agencies with the most active um, uh, programs. Conversely, we found at six agencies that had uh, uh, less active programs, we found an absence of those three factors. Our third objective Our third objective, and again at the request of this committee, was to take a look at the uh, uh, interagency coordination process. Uh, for that, we looked first at the committee uh, that called the Interagency Suspension and Debarment Committee. This is a committee that was created by executive order in the mid-'80s. Uh, recently, it received statutory recognition and statutory direction in the uh, 2009 Defense Authorization um, Act where Congress outlined uh, specific responsibilities for this interagency committee. So we wanted to take a look at how that committee was functioning uh, and what are the challenges that, uh, that it was facing. Uh, briefly stated, um, the main function of that committee is to serve as the lead agency um, determination forum. Uh, when uh, an entity um, uh, may be running afoul of the law, may be suspected of uh, uh, some conduct that might lead to a suspension or debarment. The first issue on the table is which agency ought to take responsibility to pursue that. 
And that question gets resolved at this interagency suspension and debarment committee. They often act very quickly through an email process or telephone to quickly decide on which agency needs to step forward and take responsibility for pursuing either a suspension or debarment against the, uh, against the entity. But we found that this uh, interagency committee faced challenges. First major challenges was resource, resources. They have no dedicated personnel. They have no budget. Uh, and we found that that uh, raised uh, some issues uh, for that committee. Uh, in terms of having to borrow staff from the members that, uh, that actually, from the chair and the vice chair in particular, that actually sit on that committee. The second uh, challenge that they faced was participation. There are um, members on the, on the committee from all of the major agencies and many of the uh, uh, second tier agencies, if you will, that do uh, less uh, activity in the, in the procurement arena in terms of uh, uh, dollar spending. But participation in the monthly meetings of, of that uh, committee is um, uh, not what it really should be. There are many agencies that simply do not participate to the level that one would expect for this, uh, for this important area. And they were challenged, uh, for example, in preparing a report that the Congress directed in that legislation that I referred to earlier. Congress directed them to prepare a report on their activities and the activities of their member organizations. And it took quite a while for them to get the cooperation of all of the agencies in order to, pre to prepare and submit that congressionally required report. Um, we had a number of recommendations in our report. And just very briefly, um, first of all, we, um, uh, we wanted for the six agencies that had the relatively inactive programs, we wanted them to adopt the practices that we outlined that we found at the agencies that had an active process. All of the agencies uh, concurred in that recommendation. Our second set of recommendations was directed to the Office of Federal Procurement Policy within the Office of Management and Budget. And that was for the, for the uh, Office of Federal Procurement Policy to issue a memorandum to all Federal agencies outlining what it takes to have an active, robust suspension and debarment program. Secondly, we wanted the Office of Federal Procurement Policy to require and provide guidance to all agencies to cooperate with the Interagency Suspension and Debarment Committee. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my prepared statement, and I would be happy to respond to uh, questions that the Committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Woods. And with that, I recognize myself. Thank you for your report. It is very thorough, and uh, we do appreciate that and the details that you put into it from there. Um, you answered several of my questions that I had initially, and that was dealing with the factors, both that uh, the three consistent factors that you saw and then those that were not being effective uh, in suspension and debarment, those three factors being absent as well. Uh, so that's very helpful to know. When you talk about dedicated staff, how many staff are you talking about typically in these agencies? Is this 1,000 people? Is this four people? Yeah, it did vary. Um, sometimes it was only one or two people. Uh, sometimes it was uh, uh, more than 10, less than 20. Okay. So it is a small group that, uh, from the agency that has been set aside and specifically tasked full-time to that? It, it ranged in terms of full-time, sir. Uh, some of the agencies did have full-time dedicated staff, um, but other uh, agencies had um, uh, part-time staff or staff that, um, who had other responsibilities, but one of their major responsibilities was to make the suspension and debarment process work. Good. Did you see a shift in effectiveness? Was it basically the size of the program where one agency may be very large, for instance, Department of the Navy that you talked about before, obviously very large, a lot of contracts there, they would submit a larger staff, another agency with fewer people? Uh, did you see a correlation in that as far as the number of people that were involved? Yeah. We did not see a correlation. We did see uh, differences. And as you pointed out, the Navy had one of the larger uh, staffs, and, and many of them were uh, full time. But we did not observe a correlation between the size of the staff and the effectiveness of the program. Okay. The actual process of suspension and debarment that they have to go through, the paperwork to fill out to complete, um, what, is there anything in that process that you determined, you know, this, this is bulky, this is difficult, this is a disincentive to do suspension and debarment based on the actual bureaucratic red tape of doing it? So is there anything you discovered in that? The, the process is relatively straightforward. Uh, the process is also um, uh, in the uh, regulation. Uh, 
It specifically um, requires that agency ad adopt an informal, as informal process as possible to avoid that kind of red tape. Uh, one of the hallmarks of the system is it, people, the action needs to be taken quickly because the whole purpose of suspensions and debarments is to protect the government's interest. And often we need to move very quickly in order to be able to do that. And so the, the uh, Federal Acquisition Regulation requires that the procedures be uh, streamlined and as informal as possible. Obviously, we will be visiting with people as we go through this from HHS or FEMA and other things that you mentioned as well in your report on that. Uh, specific recommendations that you have made as you have made those recommendations, they have been received well by those agencies. Uh, do you think it was just a matter of very busy in other areas and just didn't pay attention to the suspension and debarment uh, areas? What, what, what did you discover from that and what's the follow-up been like? Sure. Well, first of all, we were very pleased that all of the agencies concurred uh, with the recommendations. And what we found during the course of the review is that even at the agencies that had uh, the less active programs, that steps were being taken at each of the agencies um, to uh, uh, to get serious about the suspension and debarment process. And there is a description in the report of several agencies with specific steps that those agencies are taking to do that. Okay, let me shift gears on you a little bit. The uh, statutory uh, exclusions, I know that was not a part of your total research on that. Uh, how do you feel like that is being applied and wh who puts that on the list? Uh, so when it is a um, uh, not a bad actor in the sense it is a statutory exclusion for whatever reason. How are they getting on that list and who is managing getting them off of that list? Sure. Well, uh, for example, let us take uh, health care fraud. That would um, fall within the bailiwick of uh, Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, that agency uh, would be responsible for putting um, uh, entities that have uh, run afoul of health care provisions, um, be it payment provisions or uh, outright health care fraud. Um, they would be responsible for putting those entities on the list. Okay. So they are getting them on there. Who is responsible for getting them off? If they have been cleared, let us say it has been five years, uh, let us say, is it an automatic removal on that? Or for those statutory areas, are they lifetime? Well, very often the statute will provide for a specific period of time, be it years um, uh, uh, or whatever. Um, and when the, um, uh, uh, that ex uh, period has expired, um, those en entities should no longer be listed. Okay, but that is automatically being pulled. The agency is not having to pursue to go back and say this needs to be pulled now. It's now been three years. I believe so, I, um, but you may want to ask uh, the second panel about that. I, I want to just be able to make sure, obviously, that that people that have been debarred uh, for a period of time that is actually pulled off, and so they can be redeemed. I guess at at the end of it. Let's talk real quickly about grants as well. Uh, you mentioned obviously grants and and the contracting world being together in this reciprocal list on it. Uh, just in your overview and, and looking at it, is that a good thing to be able to have grants and contractors together on this reciprocal list? And if so, are, are grant, uh, are agencies effective on getting to the list? This is a bad actor in the grant world, and so the people in the contracting role can also know that as well. Well, we, we do not have any insight into um, uh, the, uh, the grant process because our review was just focused on, on contracts. Okay. Um, but um, uh, the reciprocal nature uh, is one that the Congress decided uh, in the mid-90s uh, ought to be um, uh, part of the system. And we didn't come across any reason to think that that was a, um, an unwise uh, decision either then or now. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Woods. With that, I yield to Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Mr. Woods. By the way, where are you from? Uh, I'm from the Boston area originally. Is my accent um, uh, Giving me away? A little bit. Okay. Fully rounded vowels. I wish Mr. Lynch were here. <laughs> well, I also am from Boston. I see. Uh, but uh, Mr. Lynch talks more like you than I do probably, yes. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, uh, how often does suspension and debarment occur based purely on non-performance criteria? Um, there are uh, uh, various codes uh, in the uh, system. I, um, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that question as to the frequency. Um, but that is something that uh, one could use the codes, because when an, ent an agency enters an entity into the system, they are also required to, to uh, use one of the many codes so that someone could um, ide identify the reason that the entity is listed and to be in a position to answer your question. 
It just seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that non-performance ought to be one of the reasons somebody is. Yeah, it's a pretty big one. Um, you make the point, well, well, well said, that obviously different agencies are subjected to different statutory criteria, and therefore they have to conform to that, and that explains some variation among Federal agencies for uh, uh, terms and conditions for suspension and debarment. But surely there ought to be a uniform process in every agency so that we don't have the kind of variation you have described in terms of active programs and less active programs. Uh, what is the reason for the fact that some agencies have inactive programs? Um, I think it is that they haven't paid sufficient attention um, to it. Um, we found um, um, HHS, for example, is very active in the, um, uh, the Medicare fraud area and, in fact, has a substantial number of entities listed. But when you look on the procurement side, and a, uh, the, um, uh, that agency spends a fair amount of procurement dollars, but we were surprised to see that over the four-year period that we looked at, they had no suspensions and debarments based on the Federal Acquisition Regulation. Huh. That is astounding. Um, you cited the fact that uh, DOD had the most, but of course, as I said in my opening statement, that is to be expected. But if you actually looked at it on a per billion dollar contracting dollar, if you will, uh, actually they are far below some other agencies like EPA. Um, Given the fact, I, I don't know, are you familiar with the report of the Commission on Wartime Contracting that we heard from the other day? I have looked at that report, yes, sir. So the fact that there is an estimate of 31 to $60 billion of waste, fraud and abuse, how many contractors were debarred or suspended based on that finding, do you know? I don't know that, sir. Presumably there ought to be some. One would think. Yes. I mean, if it is at the higher end, you are matching Medicare fraud, waste and abuse. That is certainly uh, a lot of money, and, the, and we were pleased that the uh, Commission uh, did focus on that and had specific recommendations as to how to improve the process. Hmm. Um, is conflict of interest one of the reasons for a suspension of debarment? I don't believe that that is listed in the Federal Acquisition Regulation as one of the uh, specific causes um, called out in the regulation. But if if a, if a determination is made that there is a conflict of interest, you know that you uh, you engage in a conflict of interest either in you know the RP process or the proposal writing process or whatever it might be, you you could be subject to being listed and prevented from contracting for some period of time. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. There is there is um, uh, catch all language, if you will. Um, in the Federal Acquisition Regulation that permits the suspension and debarment official to take action for other reasons that that official considers so serious as to warrant listing on the system. One of the criticisms one hears sometimes from contractors <clears throat> about that is that it can be, uh, first of all, the penalty is you know, severe, and, uh, and uh, conflict of interest can sometimes be very much uh, subjective judgment. For example, you may be a large contractor and you have been asked to provide your expertise for a Federal Advisory Panel, Scientific Panel, Defense Panel, Intelligence Panel. And even in advance, I know of cases where you know, consent was gotten that if we do that, we don't want to be prevented from bidding on some contracts. And, and subsequently, somebody comes along in the IG's office and determines, wait a minute, you, you were on this panel and you're, you've bid on a contract, you won the contract, and we call that a conflict, and you're going to be listed. And so my time's up, but uh, how are we also making sure that when we decide to sort of lower the boom that, that we have determined that this is fair and that the entity has had a fair opportunity to make its case? A uh, couple of things. First of all, the decision to um, uh, list someone or to exclude the party would be made by the agency suspension and debarment official, not by the uh, inspector general or um, anyone else that um, uh, no, might but excuse me, but, wrongdoing. But the, but the IG's office may be the de de determining there is a conflict of interest, and they and they would then therefore make a referral um, to the suspension and debarment official. The other uh, safeguard is that there are procedures uh, for the entity to um, uh, bring contrary facts to make arguments to the suspension and debarment official as to why they should not 
will be listed. Thank you. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Wahlberg is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Woods, for being here and for the work uh, GAO does. Um, uh, your report uh, found that agencies with a quarter of the contract obligations of HHS have significantly more activity in this area. Uh, specifically, the Department of Interior, with annual contract obligations of approximately $23 billion, had 94 percent procurement-related or 94 procurement-related actions and 10 grant-related suspension and debarment actions. Department of Transportation, uh, with contract obligations of approximately $23 billion, had 11 procurement-related suspensions or debarments and 193 grant-related actions. HHS, uh, in contrast, though, has $80 billion in contract obligations and during the same time period had zero procurement-related actions and 29 grant actions. In, in, in your opinion, um, is HHS failing in regards to uh, suspension and debarment? We were surprised at those numbers as well, sir. Um, we did not look at uh, the two agencies, Interior and Transportation, but when we did look at um, um, Health and Human Services, we were surprised at the number, um, uh, the absence of any activity in the suspension and debarment arena, given the size of their procurement spending. Uh, what, did it, what it does or did it lack in this area, and, and, and uh, would this have been something is this something that um, you would say, judging by all of the other studies that you did, is is acceptable? Uh, they, in response to your first question, they lacked the uh, three attributes that we specifically found at the agencies with the active programs. Uh, they lacked the um, uh, the dedicated staff, the policies and procedures, and the uh, active referral process. When we talked to um, the officials at Health and Human Services, they in fact acknowledged that their, the suspension and department tool was underutilized at their agency. Okay. Going along that line then, uh, if you could explain what you mean by detailed policies or guidance. Certainly. What does that look like? Certainly. Um, at one level, the Federal Acquisition Regulation provides the uh, policies and procedures, and it is uh, quite detailed. But we would expect to see, and in fact what we found at the agencies with the active programs, was even further detail in their implementing guidance. Uh, in other words, roles and responsibilities. Who actually implements and is charged with implementing the various provisions in the Federal Acquisition Regulation? We found those answers in the four agencies. We did not find those answers at the other agencies. Okay. Okay. Um, I yield back. Thank you. Thank, thank you for yielding on that. Let me do one quick follow-up question if the gentleman will yield. I will yield. Just to clarify, if these agencies, very large as they may be, would just reassign two or three people to focus in on that, we have the potential of finding a lot of bad contractors that we can protect the rest of the Federal Government from through suspension and debarment. So we are not talking about a massive shift in agencies. We are talking about even reassigning two or three people. Is that correct? We are not talking about a massive shift. And in fact, uh, some of the agencies um, uh, complain to us that they cannot, they are not in a position to devote full time people. They are not in a position to hire people. And we understand that in today's um, budget environment. But reassigning people or, or um, carving out um, some uh, part time responsibility for individuals, for even a small number of individuals, would have the kind of impact that you just described, sir. Terrific. Thank you for yielding, Mr. Wahlberg. Mr. Murphy is recognized five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your uh, testimony. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the portion of your uh, testimony related to the Interagency Suspension and Debarment Committee. Um, uh, the 2009 Defense Authorization gives them some increased powers and responsibilities, but uh, you, know, you clearly seem to suggest that there is a lot more that they could do. Um, they are a coordinating agency, but they have got very little teeth. Um, wh what specifically would you recommend that we do? in order to give uh, that committee the kind of teeth that would, it, at the very least, allow them to collect more information or get the, uh, the people that do not have active programs at the table, uh, or maybe at an even sort of next level, give them actual um, uh, 
give them something more than just the power to convene and monitor? What do you suggest we do there? We think the action needs to come from the uh, Office of Federal Procurement Policy. And we think it, um, it would be relatively simple and straightforward for the Office of Federal Procurement Policy to issue guidance to all Federal agencies to uh, cooperate much more fully with the interagency committee in terms of participation in the process, in terms of um, uh, responding to uh, data requests, in terms of providing staff uh, where possible to support the activities of that committee. Does that committee have enough staff? That committee does not have any in dedicated staff. Does, okay. So where does that a, committee staff come from? The chair and the vice chair, at least during the period of our review, would use their own resources from their home agency to uh, carry out the activities of the committee. So, so let, let's say that that directive comes down and there is a requirement that, uh, that data and information is provided. The question is, so what? What does that really do, just to have more information or more resources at the interagency's committee uh, if they don't really have any power to compel uh, particular agencies to step up and change their practices? Um, I'm not sure that's uh, that's really needed. We have um, um, the Office of Management and Budget that has the kind of teeth that you were uh, uh, referring to. Uh, we have the Office of Federal Procurement Policy within OMB. That who is charged with responsibility for making this system work. Uh, we think the pieces, the, um, uh, the mechanisms are there. It is just a question of using those mechanisms. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. And with that, Mr. Woods, I appreciate very much your testimony. I would like to take a short recess in order for the clerks to be able to prepare for our second panel. We will try to do the testimony of our second panel and get that into the record, and then we may have to come back to be able to pummel you with questions and uh, be able to go through that process. And with that, we will take a short Mr. recess. Mr. Today. Chairman, could I just, uh, before Mr. Woods goes? You most certainly may. I th uh, just a quick question. I think you uh, legislatively, would it be helpful, do you think, if we had some legislation that tightened up some of the reporting requirements and standardization issues your report has covered? I am not sure additional legislation is needed at this point. Uh, the Congress was uh, very clear a couple of years ago on the, um, uh, the importance of the interagency committee, uh, on, the, on the roles and responsibilities that the Congress expected that committee to play. Uh, and uh, the administration uh, issued a uh, uh, change to the Federal Acquisition Regulation to reinforce and implement the direction that the Congress gave. Uh, I think, again, the pieces are there. It is just a question of um, uh, managing that and stressing the importance of this area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would think a day like today does stress the importance of that area. Yes. I think. Thank you, Mr. Woods. We will take a short recess and reset.